The video you're about to watch has been designed to take you deeper, higher, and wider into Yahweh. Enjoy, and please subscribe. Thank you. Father, we just want to just glorify and magnify your majestic name and be reminded of, of your glory, that sometimes we, we can't feel it, we can't see it. But the reality of the fact is, so just because you can't feel something, and we feel it. It's always there, but it's in the spirit and it's dimensions of your glory. It's fire that's been released into your spirit that, that we have the ability to legislate into this physical realm with such an extent that it will bring alignment to the city that we're in right now, Homa. It will bring alignment to the cities around Homa. It will bring us alignment to the state and to the nation. The, the sons and daughters that is walking in the spirit in the earth it's literally through the power of Yahweh that breathes in and through us, living out of the four faces, operating out of the Yat, the Hay, the Bath, the Hay, and every other Hebrew letter, understanding the gates and the doors of the fiery burning ones, which is the letters. We're beginning to legislate into the earth a dimension of alignment that's pulling things back into place, back into the image of Yahweh, Father, and it's incredible. It's exciting to be part of all of this. It's, it's mind-blowing to see how things are just beginning to work according to what has been spoken, according to what has been prophesied. It's exciting to see what you're busy doing in the earth. It's incredible to see what your sons and daughters are walking in, Father. That our focus is not to the signs and the wonders. Although the signs and the wonders are great, raising the dead, casting out demons, cleansing the lepers, healing the sick, these are things are awesome. The gifts are phenomenal and we love them and we honor them and we honor those who walk in them, those who have built ministries from them. But Father, there is a time and a season that we are going to grow out of signs and wonders. We're going to begin to understand that we are called to be signs and wonders. Yes. That we are sons and daughters that lives in the spirit and in the spirit in the kingdom of heaven. All things are exposed and the power and the fullness of the glory of Yahweh is given to all sons, all daughters in its full capacity. Where we do not have to only operate in the gifts as per Holy Spirit's utterance. We get to walk in that dimension of fullness all the time. Yes. Instead, of being prophet, instead of prophesying, we become oracles. We legislate the kingdom of heaven into the earth. Signs and wonders will follow us because we are signs and wonders. Yes. We're going to begin to understand how the ecclesia look as you take us back to the days of Moses where he came out of the mountain of the Lord and his, his reflection to the people were literally with horn-like experiences. Thunder, lightning coming out of his face. His face shifting, lion, ox, eagle, man. So much so that it freaked them out. But yet when he spoke, they focused and they listened because of the glory and the fire of Yahweh burning around him. And Father, that was him being a sign and a wonder. And I believe that you are raising up a people that will be just that in the earth. And that's not our focus. Our focus is intimacy and worship unto you. As we go and live beyond the veil, we begin to understand what it means to physically be in the spirit. And it changes everything. It changes who we are. It changes who you have destined, who you have destined for us to be. Because praying in the Spirit is not uh, being in the Spirit is not just praying in the Spirit. You know, to be in the Spirit, you're physically in the Spirit. It's shifting from the natural to the supernatural. It's shifting from the natural to the to the spirit realm, the natural realm to the spirit realm. It's understanding that I am spirit being above and overshadowing my 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 human being side. So my spirit overshadows my soul and my body. And Father, I know that we don't always understand these things. We don't understand the course. We don't always understand how your system of order works. But you're teaching us, Father. We're engaging daily. And we're going deeper and wider, higher into revelation. And things are getting opened. Things are opening up for us. And we're engaging into it. And we want to honor and praise and worship you, Father, for tonight. I pray for revelation in the hearts of everyone here. For us to have understanding and knowledge of what you're revealing to us. We love you, my King. You're majestic. Amen. Everybody good? Great. Yes.
what I want to try and do tonight is I want to, I want to engage, and I know we've touched base on most of these things already. We've got an ad city session tomorrow. This is our fourth one. So we've done the dividing soul and spirit. We've done uh, uh, thoughts and intents of the heart, and we did the uh, bone and the marrow. Am I right? Or the, the marrow and the joints. So what I want to touch base on is the nine skins and stepping into it. Understanding the idea that the Father has behind this and the protection that He almost wants to, not sayingly promise, but promises. So it's us having an understanding, having a knowledge of what He's releasing, what He's revealing to us and stepping into it. And it's almost the logic of it because I am in the Holy Spirit, He's in me, I'm in Yeshua, He's in me, I'm in the Father and He's in me. Right now, him, uh, <clears throat> it's something we don't really understand, me being in Him and Him being in me at the same time. That kind of boggles our minds, right? But we, we need to begin to understand how intense that really is and how the Father wants us to begin to live out of Him. It's rep represented by the four faces, and we understand the four faces represents um, the apostolic, the prophetic, kingly, and priestly. Right? We begin to understand that out of the four faces is the dimension of the Yod, the Hay, the Vav, the that's just four letters. Oh, that's actually three letters of the Hebrew language. Um, the double Hay that the Father wants to bring emphasis on. Of course, your uh, responsibility is to study them and to engage into them because they are gates. I always say this, and I'm sure most of us know it by now, they are living creatures that was created by Yahweh. We can engage in it. As a matter of fact, if you, you want to find them in the kingdom of heaven, you'll find them in the kingdom inside of Yahweh. Uh, that's where I see them. That's where I engage with them because I remember the very first hug I got from the Father. Inside of Him, they were living gates. And I never knew what they were until I started engaging into them. And as I studied the letters, I began to realize that looks like a hey, that looks like a, a gimel, that looks like the, the dalit, that looks like the top. It started representing themselves to me as these letters, but they were, they were revelationary get, uh, gates of fire. It was almost like an explosive fire that wants to pull you in. And because that's their desire, is for you to walk through these gates. And it represents what the high priest would do as he walks through the veil. You understand? He walks through the veil, and through the veil he goes through every generation of high priests before him. He goes through their intimacy with the Father, their revelation, their understanding, their bloodline, everything that they received from Yahweh at the point that they were uh, in office. And so as he walks through them, that's what he engages with. And that's kind of the same thing. As I step into Yahweh, I engage in these letters and they want to pull me in so I can walk through them and engage all that revelation, knowledge, insight that's made available for me as I go into it. But when we look at the nine skins, now, you can call it nine skins, you can call it nine dimensions, you can just call it the um, nine stones that we step into, but it's represented through the Holy Spirit, Yeshua, and the Father. And it's really just for me to begin to understand dimensions that the Father has made available for me to step into. And stepping into it, it opens me up for who the Holy Spirit really is, it opens me up for who Yeshua really is, it opens me up for who the Father really is. So I'm going to take these nine aspects and just kind of elaborate a little bit on them and see where we go from there. Okay, so we start with Holy Spirit, which is, uh, you know, for me, Holy Spirit was one of the most incredible beings to engage. Um, at, at first, on this side of the veil, you can't really picture him because he's represented as a spirit, right? So if you read the older translation, it says ghost. I don't know about you, but that kind of freaked me out a little bit. Right? First of all, all my life, I was afraid of ghosts. Why? I don't know. I remember it being a dream, and in this dream I was chased by a ghost. And it was very funny because this ghost had a bread knife. No, not a bread knife, a butter knife. Which is not really very scary. <laughs> but I guess as a little kid, that was kind of freaky. He chased me under the chair, and it freaked me out. So when I got born again, I was not engaging Holy Spirit all that, uh, Holy Spirit all that much. Just because of the fact that they call him Holy Ghost. Because it's a spooky idea that really doesn't get elaborated on much. Um, his, uh, his Holy Spirit instead of, you know, he's the Holy Spirit instead of just Holy Spirit. Um, you can't see him, touch him, feel him. He's the one that brings comfort and he teaches and he guides. And that's just what we were taught. But when you step behind the veil and you physically look at him and you begin to understand the beauty of who he really is and you step into all of what he represents, it kind of changes. When you spend time with him, starts engaging individually into him and gets to know Holy, get to know Holy Spirit from a different perspective, everything changes. That's that intimacy, that, uh, that dimension of Yahweh has been longing for. 
because it's more than just comfort. It's more than him just wanting to teach you. Uh, there is a lot of teaching. There's a lot of revelation in uh, engaging with the Holy Spirit, but it's really bringing you to the order of what you can engage, aligning you with, with that which was made available for you to go into. It's uh, bringing you to the full understanding of the protocol regarding what is available for you as a son in Holy Spirit to engage. And that includes the seven spirit, it includes the angelic canopy, it includes the courts, it includes the mobile court, and it includes legislation that needs to take place for you in the kingdom of, of heaven, about the kingdom of earth. Things that you need to do according to your scroll. Holy Spirit opens up all that. This thing is going to drive me nuts today, I don't know why. It's leaning, it's like a leaning, it's okay, don't worry about it. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, it's my own issues, yeah. Um, in Romans 14, it says, For the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and the joy of Ruach HaKadosh, Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. I like this translation of the Bible most of the time, but then when you get to Revelations and you start engaging in what they read there, they don't call it the seven spirits of God. They call it the sevenfold spirit of God, which is an unbiblical interpretation not right. That's the, the tree of life. Or the, the, I think it's the tree of life translation. Um, but every every other step they talk about shalom instead of peace. They talk about ruach kadesh instead of holy spirit, which I like. They bring in a bit of the Hebrew. So they haven't taken all of the Hebrew out and replaced it with Greek. So it's kind of nice, but it's still man's interpretation, right? You know, I mean, you are, are, are understand that we are the only religion that does not study our original text. We study man's translations from all the different aspects. But so if you look at Holy Spirit, there's not there's three skins that the Father has made available for me to engage and go into. It's righteousness, uh, peace, and joy. And of course, his desire has always been for the Ecclesia to understand what righteousness means. Just the fact that, that through Christ, the gate has been opened for me to be aligned. Because righteousness means to be in right standing with Yahweh. That's why you can't be more righteous today than what you were yesterday. Righteousness is a gift, and the idea of righteousness is because of what Yeshua did, because of the blood that he, that he spilled for you, you have the ability to enter in through his wounds. That's why after the first 40 lashes, he realized this wasn't it. How many of you have seen the Passion of Christ? So he gives them 40 lashes just with the, with the whip. And um, he was already beaten down, and as he got up, he realizes that wasn't it. Because it wasn't meant to be hit with uh, just a whip. It was meant to be the nine, the cat of nine tails. Which is bones and pieces of glass and pieces of metal that's strapped into the leather of nine strips. So every, every one lash is like being lashed nine times. So you've got 30, 39 lashes times nine. And of course nine represents the judgment and the idea behind him knowing this wasn't it because his flesh wasn't torn. His flesh had to be torn so that the glory could come out, so that the blood can be shed. And the idea is that because the, 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 the skin is torn off and the, body, the, 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 the temple is open, we have the ability to go in. That's, that's the whole idea. That's why if you see that the this, this, this spear goes into the side and blood and water comes out, and we understand that the only time that that happens is at birth, where there's blood and water. The blood and water equals birth. The blood and water out of the side equals the bride. You know, the Father has made it available for us to begin to understand what it means to go back in. Going back in is what the doorways of the blood really represented. If you understand blood, it is conjugal light. They say that within blood it contains very small particles of gold. In the blood it is uh, dimensions of portholes that is there for us to engage and go into. This is just our own blood. You know, your blood is not a normal substance. It's really freaky. Um, but through Yeshua, these gates opens up and it aligns me. It brings me back into the revelation that I am okay with God. I've been restored. And the Father again looks upon me and sees me as pure and holy and as white as snow. It's different. So when I have that understanding, I'm standing right in the right place with Yahweh and He begins to pour into me. Because through the blood I'm restored and the gift of righteousness is what opens me up. So Holy Spirit can now begin to engage. Because I'm in alignment, Holy Spirit is sent in and He begins to direct my every step. Right? But of course we are understanding the fact that he, doesn't want to, that he does not want to direct my every step for the rest of my life. 
So as a child, as a baby, he wants to direct my steps until I have grown up to the position where I now know what to do. But righteousness is the first dimensional shift that I need to take in my thinking. I need to understand that I'm righteous because Satan is out there to bring condemnation. Right? But the righteous and those who understand their righteousness will not be condemned. Of course, we understand that Yahweh didn't come to bring condemnation. He came to, to set us free. He came to convict us. That's what Holy Spirit will do. Bring conviction, but not condemnation. Satan's con condemnation it brings you to the place where you say, where he says, you are uh, low down, dirty, shame. How dare you now want to go read the Bible? You want to go pray again after what you did? But we have to remind ourselves that what we have seen as sin and, and what we have seen as wrong up to this point is not even what the Father focuses on. It's none of his concern, to be honest, because sin is not what you do. And we are slowly but surely the church will begin to understand this, but sin is not what you do, sin is who you are. And through the restoration of Yeshua and what he did uh, um, on the cross for us, I have been restored. The restoration takes me out of the things that I did as my, my um, vocal point or my focus point, because that's when you are eating of the tree of uh, good and evil. That you focus on what you do. And it's all about, is this right? Is that wrong? Can I, can I wear pants as a woman to church? Can I uh, blow dry my hair? Can I, put up my, can I put makeup on? You know, as a man, can I do this? Can I do that? Is, is this okay? Is that okay? Because there's no relationship. It's just because you eat of what's right and you eat of what's wrong. And so you want to balance. And of course the father said, well, why don't you rather eat of the tree of life? That's why the blood has opened up that dimension for us to go into. Because eating of the tree of life takes away the do-do list. And it brings you to a place of revelation, understanding of who you are. The, the focus is not to miss the mark. And the mark is not to stop smoking and stop drinking. That's just the logic of it, right? To miss the mark is to be disobedient. Yeah. The obedience is really the Father's heartbeat. But in the same breath, He doesn't want you to walk in your perception of obedience. Because our perception of the obedience is do this, do that, do this, do that. And that's not what the Father wants either. Because that is a slave mentality. You, know, you don't want to do the obedience out of your mentality as a slave. Because that's not the Father's heart either. If you talk to any of the Israelites, they would do everything and anything the Father says because of their mentality. Not because they love Him, not because they're in marriage covenant with Him, but because he, they feel that He gave them Ten Commandments. And we're beginning to understand that it wasn't Ten Commandments. He never commanded them anything. It was a marriage covenant. It was a desire for him to show them what he desires from this marriage, from this dimension of love that he wants them to walk in with him. And he was waiting for them to respond with their side of the covenant. But they didn't because they had a mentality of slavery. So they immediately said, well, this is the Ten Commandments that we have to abide to. And what it eventually became was just law again. And so the Father just kind of wants us to begin to understand righteousness takes me out of that place of do-do's and do do not <laughs> and places me in a place of intimacy and relationship because it aligns me it opens me up and i get to go into him i get to spend time with him see him touch him feel him and begin to know his intimate desires for who i am and for what he has called me to and of course we have peace now peace uh, we have to understand peace is not that uh, good feeling that you have if you have peace about something then go for it you know we understand that's a good thing but peace is a dimensional shift that takes place in one that operates outside of Christ, or oh, inside of Christ, not outside of Christ. Inside of Christ, there's a place of rest, a dimension of shalom, and uh, that we in the natural can't fathom. I can have peace about something. I remember um, sitting on a chair just like you guys are sitting tonight, and I was waiting for my client. I was a personal trainer, and um, one of the, the, the personal trainers came in, and I mean, I, I loved the guy. He was a really good guy, um, but I guess uh, uh, out of a religious principal he was bisexual he would have boyfriends one day and then he actually brought his boyfriend from america um and they were just together for a while and he had a girlfriend again and he's this weird uh, in and out guy but he looks at me and he says why are you so at peace you know, because it's visible it's it's you can literally see someone that's at peace and i said to him well it's because i have christ you know it was an instant response why you look so peaceful because i have christ because that's where peace comes from. 
It's that, it's that dimensional shift that takes place in who you are because you're placed in a dimension of Yahweh that brings you to a place of absolute rest and peace. And of course, Shalom and speaking Shalom as a son or daughter of Most High is that ability that we have to bring things into alignment. That's why if you begin to understand Shalom, you can speak Shalom into your family, you can speak Shalom in your workplace, you can speak Shalom in any uh, dimension that you have the ability to speak into, because as a son and a daughter that lives out of the kingdom of heaven, begin to speak Shalom, that literally changes things and brings it back into place. It's part of legislation. As a matter of fact, Shalom is a dimension of legislation that we need to begin to have revelation of and walk in. And slowly but surely, the Father will begin to show us this. Because we've just now we've nowadays we've just made it a way of greeting people. Shalom, peace, peace be with you, bless you. Um, just like everything else we've taken uh, in the church and just made it words. Hallelujah, praise God, Amen. You know, it's it's sound, no one even really knows what it means anymore. It's just being said because it became uh, a rhythm in what we engage. No, no, nothing wrong with it, but I really just believe the Father wants us to begin to focus on the things we say, because I can say certain things until I turn blue in my face, but if I speak it from my spirit into the earth, it changes everything. Yes. You know, so when we agree with something and we say amen, may it not just be something we say, but we literally agree, because there, where, there's, where there's agreement, there's power. Yes. Yes. But if I'm just saying amen, hallelujah, praise God, because that's how I was religiously raised up, it has no power. It's knowingly engaging in what's coming out of your mouth. That's why when I say shalom, I don't greet people saying shalom. I don't hug people and say shalom. When uh, they say it to me, I'll say it back to them. But when I say it back to them, and I'm not saying that if they're saying it to me at this point, that it's just words coming out of their mouth. Um, I believe that the ones who says it to me have the same revelation. But in returning a shalom, it is bringing alignment. It's that, that heart-to-heart hug. That's what brings alignment. That's what brings peace. People may say, well, I don't want to hug heart to heart because what if I get his demons or he gets my demons or there's a transfer? It doesn't work like that. And I know everybody don't understand that, but I remember one, one engagement I had at quite an intense time with Yahweh. And in this process, a man of my nation who passed away, phenomenal revelation. Matter of fact, 15 years ago, he was already teaching this stuff. And it was accepted everywhere, but it didn't preach quite in this manner, but the semantics were different, but the revelation was the same. Um, he had phenomenal um, uh, miracles in his church, just the most amazing things. But I always hungered after his revelation. I always hungered after the things that he walked in, not so much the signs and the miracles and the wonders and those things, that, although I desire it, but that's not really, wasn't my focus. It was always to have the, his understanding of the word, revelation that he walks in. And he came to me in this engagement and he said to me, um, I want to give you my mantle. Now, he's already passed away for many years, and he said, I wanted to give you my mantle. And my natural thought was, I don't want your mantle, you died of cancer. But that was just my ignorance at this point. He said to me, the mantle I give you is one of revelation, one of insight, the knowledge and understanding of the word and that which I preached. It doesn't come with anything else. Because where he was at that point, none of what he uh, died of was there. There was no remembrance of any death, um, decay, or what we engage with in the earth. So we need to understand that when, 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 when we get from the sons and daughters of the Most High, it's got nothing to do with what they had in the earth. It's what they were given in the spirit. So when I hug you heart to heart, you're not going to get any of my issues. And I'm not going to get any of your issues. And it should not be a fear, because it's the fear, it's the love of God that casts out fear. Yes. So we love each other, we care for each other, we're not going to bring anything upon each other that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your issues and your problems, that's your issues and your problems. It's none of my concern. Do I engage? That be, I only engage what the Father shows me to engage, and I only overshadow what the Father shows me to overshadow. You know, it's, it's none of my... It's none of my um, how can I say this not to make it sound too bad? It's not, a, my, it's not my responsibility to engage your issues. Absolutely. It's just not. It's your responsibility. And I always say this. Um, when, when someone's really overweight and fat, I do not have to tell them they're fat. They don't have to. Nobody has to tell them they're fat. They're fat. They know they're fat. Right? And if someone is smoking, I don't have to tell them to stop smoking because everybody I know that smokes wants to stop. If you drink too much wine, you know you're drinking too much wine. It's not something anybody has to tell you. As a matter of fact, if you have sin in your life, 
Nobody has to echo that into the atmosphere because you know exactly what's going on in your heart. If you're a son of God, a daughter of God, you love Yahweh, you know exactly what you're doing wrong. And the Father doesn't want us to, He wants you to speak Shalom because Shalom brings alignment. Shalom, literally, with the knowledge of what you're saying and the power that it comes out of, remind yourself you're a son of Yahweh, a daughter of Yahweh, you live and move and have your being in Him. When you speak that dimension of the Holy Spirit into place, it opens up realms. It brings alignment. And then, of course, you have joy. Now, this is, this is the three skins of Holy Spirit. Righteousness, joy, and peace. Joy is a dimension of the kingdom of heaven that is legislated into your heart when you get born again. It's not happiness, because happiness is a feeling. Joy is literally a dimension of Holy Spirit that's in you because He's in you. It's an overshadowing realm of who He is, where He comes from. It's a legislation that He brought with Him into the earth so that you can have it in your heart. It brings you to a place of knowledge regarding who you are now that you are born again or born from above. It brings you a knowledge of who you are now that you live in Him and have peace and have righteousness, the alignment that's taken place. is There's a knowledge of who you are in Christ that changes who you are. It brings a dimension of joy that overshadows happiness as a feeling. If I'm going to understand, you can, you can be unhappy but still have joy. Now, but you can't be happy if you don't have joy. But it could be a feeling, you can have it for a minute, but you can lose it. But I believe, and people have said this all the time, but I do not believe that Satan can steal joy. It's not a kingdom that he can put his hands on. It's not a dimension that he has the ability to. But what he will do is he will take your happiness and out of ignorance we will think that he's taken or stealing our joy. I don't believe because joy is not something that I, I, I get from a friend or a family member. Joy is something I get from engaging the Holy Spirit which comes out of the kingdom of heaven. So it's legislation from that realm to this realm that I walk in. And Satan does not have a place in that kingdom. Now he can take my happiness because it's a feeling, but he cannot take my joy. Now we can have a debate regarding this, but I'm not in the mood because it doesn't matter. <laughs> but he can take my joy. Well, if he can take your joy, then let him take it. But he cannot take my joy. It's not a realm that he has to his. But uh, it's not a realm that he has to his back and core. He can't get there. Because it comes out of the kingdom of heaven. It's still, it's still a dimension of that kingdom that surrounds me that he does not have access to. We know this stuff, right? So that's three skins. Now I want you to understand, if I step into these three skins, this is already a dimensional shift that I take that eliminates me from Satan's uh, uh, walking around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. So once I step into the Holy Spirit, already Holy, uh, Satan cannot get to me. Now, we don't live in fear. It's not, I don't do that because I'm afraid. But I do that because it's been made available for me. Matter of fact, the Father's desire for me is to engage into the Holy Spirit because with righteousness, shalom, and, and joy comes a dimension of revelation, knowledge, and insight where He teaches me, comforts me, and guides my every step because it opens up my eyes and enlightens what I look at. And I look at it through His eyes. I look at it and listen to it through His ears. And it opens up things for me so I can go deeper into what I need to know. Because he leads me to Yeshua, and Yeshua leads me to the Father. Yes. And of course, those combinations of revelation takes me into the fullness of the Yad, the Hay, the Vav, the Hay, the fullness of Yahweh. How are you guys doing? Hey. Okay, so we look at, at Jesus, or Yeshua. Now, we only call him Yeshua because in the Hebrew language, there's no J. And so his name could never have been Jesus, ever. It doesn't matter because we call him Jesus by faith and it's because of our faith that we have power in that name. And of course we also begin to understand now that it wasn't so much in the name spoken as what it was in the positional place in the name that we have had power. So whether you want, want to call him Jesus or you want to call him Yeshua in South Africa, in my language his name, his name is Jesus, Jesus, which is much closer to Yeshua. <laughs> But he says is spelled the same as Jesus. Um, and and uh, some other African languages, so it sounds different. In, in every other language, his name sounds different. In English, it's Jesus, but in every other name, it's, it's different. But if you look at the original, it never had a J because the Hebrew language doesn't have a J in it. So if you take the J out, you begin to understand it was Yeshua. Okay, but again, that's then the Yod, the He, the Shen, the Vav, the He. 
and you engage in those five letters, which are now four letters, but again the double hey, you begin to understand the dimension of Yahweh within those gates and how it will pour and take you into a deeper place in the knowledge of who He really is. So again, we look at the three skins that comes with Yeshua. And of course we know that Jesus is the Word. But Yeshua is the Word. And we also now have to begin to understand. I'm going to touch on this very mildly. I have a full hour of teaching on this. So I want to touch on it mildly now and then go into it the next time we, we, we come together. So you have in John 14, it says, um, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Okay? And of course, we haven't taught on it yet, but we begin to understand the name of Jesus. That we don't, the way we have prayed was uh, a Greek mindset. So we pray, pray, blah, 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 in the name of Jesus. And because we said in the name of Jesus, that should seal the deal. And if God doesn't answer the prayer right, it either wasn't His will, or it wasn't His timing, or it shouldn't have happened, or I just prayed the wrong way, and it wasn't His will for me to get what I've asked for. But that will be understood because, well, I said in the name of Jesus, so that magic charm should have worked. But in the reality, if you understand the Hebrew, then you begin to know that it's not so much in the name of Jesus, the spoken name, it is being in the name, physically, in the name. Jesus never cast demons out of, in, in the name of Jesus. He never did anything in the name of Jesus. He was in a position. He was inside of the yard, the hay, the vat, the hay. He breathed and lived from out of the name. If you understand the Hebrew culture, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies and he would begin to sing these four letters. The north, the south, the east, and the west. And he would breathe his entire breath out every time he speaks the name. And the representation of that would be him stepping into the name. So he would go, Yod. And so his breath is out. Because you cannot say Yahweh without breathing in and out. Right? So they would do that to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And then that represents him stepping into the name which is different than speaking in the name of Jesus. So we look at the way, and first of all, of course, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, represented by the Word. In 1 John, it basically tells us that He is the Word, uh, was always the Word, the Word is um, through Him, He is the Word. Uh, everything was created because of Him, for Him, and through Him. Right. So we look at Him saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that would be the three dimensions of the Word. The written the spoken, and of course the living. He is the living, but he is also the, the spoken, and he's also the written. If you understand the written, which is our, our Logos, which is the, the Word of God, the Bible, as what we know it today, the, the word Logos means, or uh, it's either the Hebrew word or the um, Greek word, I think the Hebrew word is perusio, which means um, the mind of Christ. So the Word of God is the mind of Christ. It's the way God thinks. And of course, as I engage, it, it changes the way I perceive things. As I engage and study it, it brings me to a place of revelation regarding the, uh, regain, regarding the thought pattern of God and how He would think of certain things, how He would, would operate through his, his way of organization and how He would legislate things into place. But of course, it's not enough. I can't just engage the things that he wrote down, because he must have spoken much more than what he wrote down. Right? So we have to understand that that which was spoken is so much more than that which is written. And he even went as far as to say, well, the things I did, if he had to write it all down, it would fill the libraries of the world. And we've got one book. And we've got only one book, and we focused only on this one book. Now, there's nothing wrong, don't misunderstand me. This is a phenomenal book. It holds everything together. Everything we engage has parts and it's partially in there. We don't engage outside of the Word. We might not always perceive the Word the way it's written because we have a perception and the Father will overshadow your perception any time of the day, but He will never overshadow His Word. But we can perceive the Word in one manner and He can overshadow that perception in a, a whole different dimension because we look at the Word through one eye, but the Word's got three dimensions. So we've got the living Word that has, uh, the, the written Word that's got three dimensions. Uh, we've got the living, uh, the, the, the um, spoken word that's got three dimensions. And we've got the living word that's got three dimensions. That already in itself is nine dimensions that we can shift into. And basically what that is, is I've got the written, which is the Bible. And out of the Bible you've got milk, meat, and mystery. That's the three. And out of that which is spoken, it's the same thing. You've got the milk, the meat, and the mystery. Out of Yeshua himself, you've got the milk, the meat, and the mystery. And his desire for us is to engage in all of that. 
How are you guys doing? Great. So it's the way. I would go as, to far, as far as to say that the way is what was written down. It might not be, but I represent. Uh, I look at it through through what I perceive it to be. And if I begin to understand what was written, was written through the hands of man that had intimacy with the Father, uh, that was directed. Now, if you look at the first five books, it is absolutely supernatural, right? I mean, Moses is engaging for 40 days, comes back, freaks out, and goes back in for another 40 days. Comes out, writes of the beginning of creation in such detail that he knows the genealogy of people he's never met or had any understanding or revelation of, just stories told by his fathers, 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 fathers. No real knowledge of it, but yet in detail he writes of their, their genealogy. He writes exactly what happened out of the, the, the kingdom of heaven, out of the, um, um, Eden and out of paradise, and how the Father created and how he shaped and everything. And then he still writes of his own birth and he writes of his own death. It's incredible, right? Oh, yeah. So we're looking at, at what, what was made available and how the Father kind of wants us to understand that, uh, no, something is against you. No, not this thing. <laughs> this thing is driving me nuts, but something just shifted. And you know, on, on Monday, something shifted, and things just opened up so much. And I believe that that's kind of what the Father is doing right now. He's allowing the legislation of the sons and daughters to create shifts in the spirit that just opens things up. It just opens up everything. Um, but as I, as I look at the way, and I begin to understand that it is that which is written by man. So it is still done by faith. And we have to trust that what man engaged with was what the Father wanted to, to, to come into fruition. And that was what was written down. So it takes faith to believe and study the Word of God. Am I right? Yes. So nowadays we have that which was spoken. Now, that which was spoken by the sons and daughters of Yahweh is the engagement into the living letters. Because the original word spoken, if I give you the letter A, B, C, or D... Those four letters, you can't give me an explanation of any of them. Matter of fact, those four letters in, in our language has no meaning. You have to add them together to get a meaning. But the Hebrew language is living, breathing language. Each letter has, if you get some of the books on Amazon on these letters, you can buy a book that has literally about 20 pages per letter. I remember the last time I teach these letters, I did an hour per letter. An hour of teaching per letter. The, the first time I did it, it was only... Um, 12 sessions. Um, I did sometimes two letters, sometimes three letters, uh, one or twice, or maybe I've done four letters. But uh, the second time I taught on these letters, it took me an hour to an hour and a half just to do one letter because there's so much more re the revelation that comes out. Um, so they are progressively increasing in knowledge daily because of the growth and because the infinite God that we serve. We can never engage anything in the kingdom of heaven to its limit. Because it doesn't have a limit. There's no limitations. It's, it's infinite. It is eternal. It's beyond what our natural minds can even fathom. Because we are created beings that has a birth and has a death. Well, that's what we believe it should be. It might not have to be like that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but now that we're beginning to live beyond the veil, things are changing. Because previously I couldn't see what was spoken. I couldn't hear it anymore because it was already spoken. But we forget that in the spirit, the living letters that were spoken are still out there. So now as sons and daughters with dominion and authority over the earth, we get as spirit beings to come back into this atmosphere where the word was spoken and we get to engage into it. So I would actually urge you to see if you can do that as often as possible. The idea of being a spirit being and engaging in the word, I would study the written and while I'm studying the written, my spirit will go into a section that I'm going to be reading or studying. It would physically go into the time and space that it was done in, or the time and space that it, was, uh, that it appeared in. And that which was spoken and not written, I will engage. Because we operate outside of the timeline. Um, as a spirit being, you get to go in um, outside of time and space. So if you understand the timeline in the kingdom of heaven, it's not horizontal. It's also not... Uh, vertical, it, everything happens at once, at the same time. That's why I can go back into any experience, I can go back into any um, event that has already happened in the natural and the spiritual, and I can engage into it. 
Now, I know that freaks most people out, and we don't understand, but that's not possible, that can't be done. But see, once something was done, it created a memory. If there's a memory, you can go back into it. So Christ dying on the cross created a memory, which means we can go back into it. The event that was created on that day as a spirit being, I can go back into that exact time and engage what happened there. That which wasn't spoken, that was that which wasn't written down, uh, I can engage because there was a living being that was uh, dimensionally shifting into place. I can engage that. <coughs> but then you look at his disciples moving out or his disciples going to bed or his disciples doing something that he, that they weren't there when he was doing. That's my favorite time of engagement. Going into those places where the Bible says, and he um, went into the mountains without his disciples. No one was there, just him. Or he went and prayed. Um, that's when I like to be there. Because there was no one there. When he sat and he prayed, um, just before he got um, taken by the, by the soldiers to get crucified, that's what, it's one of my favorite places to go to. To, to find his anxiety, his, his, his fear as a normal, natural human being, but then also the overshadowing of his spirit, reflecting the glory of Yahweh, who he was, what he also was thinking, how he desired to, to just do his Father's will, understanding what was meant to happen, the legislation that was already taking place in the field of him, the, in, the, the conversation he had that wasn't recorded. Um, by those who listened to him, but that which was spoken of, what, that which he revealed, or was revealed, uh, the things that was revealed to him by his father in that specific moment, that wasn't heard, that wasn't seen, that stuff that we can engage now. How are you guys doing? Great. So that's exciting. That's why it's really key for you to understand the body, soul, and spirit. It's key for you to understand that you are a spirit being that has the ability to travel. Now, I say travel, and then after church, freak out because you don't leave your body. You shouldn't do that. But just remind yourself, before you got born again or born from above, it was just soul and spirit. You were just a soul and a body. Your spirit only gave life to your soul and your body. It was not active. It, it was basically, you were operating your being as just soul and body. Right? That's what the unsaved are doing. They're just soul and body. That's why they don't have any authority over angels. They don't have any authority over demons. That's why demons can run their lives and do, do run their lives. Yes. But once you became a Christian, you added a strain to your DNA and your spirit reactivated. So when my spirit is reactivated in Christ, everything takes place in Christ. Nothing we do is outside of Christ. I don't travel in the spirit outside of Christ. He is my foundation. He is all that I operate from out of. So we don't have to have any fear. It's not new age. New ages travel outside of Christ. That opens their bodies and their souls for demonic activity. It's not a good thing. Okay? If you look at their lives, you will very quickly understand. Peace is not part of what they walk in. They might believe that it's peace and they have alignment. They do not. They have demonic alignment. Because outside of Christ, you do not have that capacity. Right? By faith, you can do all things. By faith, you can move mountains. But the key, and of course, what you believe, you will receive. And what you believe, you will receive outside of Christ. I don't know if you know that. Yes. Christ is not the foundation of what you believe. If I, can, I can be New Age, I can be a Muslim, a Buddhist, and if I believe something hard enough, that will take place in my life. Okay, but it's what surrounds you in the time of what you receive. That's why we want to do everything in Christ. So I'm not saying let's move out into the atmosphere, out of our bodies, outside of Christ. It happens inside of Christ. He's your guide. He's what leads you. And of course, you're engaging in worship and adoration to Him. And His desire is to take you in and show you what happened. Now, you're not going to go in there and immediately know what happened, what's taking place. Because you're not immediately going to see everything. So it's something you have to constantly do. And if you have a lack of focus like I do, you have to go in a million times. I have an angel with me, Focus and Passion. They are with me all the time. I have Zeth Kiel with me all the time as well. I've got several angels that comes and goes. The three that I've just mentioned always is always with me. Zeth Kiel is assigned to my bloodline and our ministry and has excessive uh, revelation. It's actually an archangel that brings me revelation and knowledge and uh, explains and expresses to me how to bring what I know to the people that I'm supposed to minister to. Um, passion and Focus are like my... Um, I don't know what you would call them. They're just like my angels. They're always with me. Like they, they, passion is supposed to increase my passion for the things that I do. So I don't get tired. I don't get overwhelmed. I don't get, uh, I'm not in the mood for this anymore. I don't want to do this. It's, been, it's already been, for me, it's been seven years I've been engaging in this. And I'm just, I just get more excited every day. 
and that's because of the passion and the engagement that he gives me. Focus, I have struggles with focus because, because I don't know, I sometimes think he's not doing his job. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm not, I'm just joking. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't struggle. I, I, what you call the, uh, the HDAD or whatever you call it, ADD. But the opposite of the one that gets you to focus on one thing. My focus is scattered everywhere. So for me to engage into something like what I'm teaching right now, I have to go back into it all the time. But I'll be focusing on this and I'll be really into, into what I'm doing and then in the squirrel. <laughs> you know what I'm squirrel, you know? So uh, that's a problem. But I, I'm working on it and it's changed a lot. You know, so I'm going in and I'm going in and you know, it's awesome and it's great squirrel. And so the squirrel thing needs to stop. But every time there's a squirrel, not right really, there's something, I don't know even what it is, but I would have to go back in. So it's engaging over and over again until so the picture starts making sense. And of course, I urge you to do the exact same thing. We don't have time to engage all the time. But when you engage, remind yourself you're engaging outside of time and space. So five minutes of engagement can be three hours in the spirit. It could be five hours in the spirit. I remember Ian, uh, Justin Abraham talking about a friend of his that was making coffee or tea. Um, the English drink more tea than coffee. So he was making tea in a tea break, which is 15 minutes. And um, in the time that the kettle was boiling, he felt that the engagement was eight months. So in his understanding of this engagement, he's already been away from his family for eight months. By the time he came back, the kettle boiled. So that's five minutes. So I understand that if we're stepping into this, if I step into the way, the truth, and the life, it's the dimensional shift that the Father wants me to go into so I can operate in Christ. Operating in Christ doesn't just give me protection, it also gives me a dimension of the Word. So I can have a knowledge of the mysteries, of the, the um, living the mysteries, the meat and the milk. But I begin to eat of all that's available. And of course, even, even within the, the milk, there's mystery and meat. Even within the, the meat, there's milk and mystery. Even within the mystery, there's milk and there's meat. For, for example, um, when I begin to engage in mystery, it's really me having to go back into the original culture of what was presented through that which is written. Because we cannot just read the Bible and say, oh, that's what he was saying, that's what he meant. Because there's certain things that Paul would say that would make no real sense in English. Right, right. And it would make no real sense in our culture. You know, for example, Paul, um, uh, in the writings uh, in the Bible, it makes a statement which says that uh, if you don't bear any fruit, I will cut you off and throw you in the lake of fire. And of course, that's kind of freaky, because if you don't bear fruit, is that what he's going to do? Is he going to cut you off? Of course, in my growth and in my engagement with the Spirit and getting to know Yeshua, that scripture made no sense. And it was taught out of our religious understanding of this is what's going to happen. If you don't bear fruit, Father will cut you off and throw you in the fire. It's like, so what I'm, if I don't bear fruit, I'm going to go to hell? Is that kind of how the Father represents himself in all of this? But I remember a friend of mine was working at a vineyard, a winery. And I asked him, because this has to be truth, right? And it has to come from a true story. So I asked him, why do you cut the fruit uh, of the vine off that doesn't bear fruit? And he said, oh, we'll never do that. We'll never cut the vine off if it doesn't bear fruit. What we'll do is we cut both the vines, but we don't cut them off. So we will align the vines, and we'll cut them both at the same places, and then we tie them together, and we lift them up off the ground. And I said, well, because the understanding of a vine is that it doesn't need to have roots. You can cut the vine, stick it in the ground, water it, and it will spring out roots. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. So what they would do is they would cut them into both sides, string them together, and let the vines, the inside of the vines, touch. So that the ones that did bear fruit will start affecting the ones that does not bear fruit. So they just call it, let's cut off the vines. And of course the representation, if we understand and read that context of the word, there was a fire burning on the outside of the city called hell. So Jesus wasn't saying that if you don't bear fruit, we're gonna, you're going to go to hell. We, we all get to understand that. And of course, another one that is in the mystery, in the, in the culture, in the deep revelation that we can't read only and get, is where Yeshua gets his disciples to say, well, you know, if you go to somebody and you share the gospel with them and they reject you, uh, shake the dust off your feet and take a piece and leave, right? Now, in the culture, if you understand, uh, being yoked to a rabbi, anybody, anybody ever heard this? 
where you basically, what happens is the rabbi goes, he chooses his disciples, and he ties a rope to them. Through, uh, it's tied to him, and they all get tied up, so they, everything he does, they have to do. Now, the, the, the disciple that is uh, second in charge, right behind the rabbi, he gets to collect all the dust that comes from the rabbi's feet on the bottom of his robe. And in the culture, it's represented as all, which is all the revelation, all the knowledge, all the insight, the anointing, the power, the glory, all that the, the rabbi carries is coming on off the one behind him, and so on and so on. So when Yeshua said to his disciples, take the dust off your feet, he wasn't telling them, well, if these, these idiots don't want to listen to you, then just take your piece, shake the dust off your feet, and may they all burn and rot in the house. You know, that's kind of what we were taught in a manner. I l heard someone say that on, a, on Facebook the other day. I was thinking to myself, you know, you type something in, and then you go, okay, fine, I'm sorry, Lord, and you delete everything again and just ignore the whole statement. But um, we begin to understand what Yahweh was saying is you leave your best. Bless them. Speak life over them. Speak increase. Don't take your peace. Leave your peace. Le give them the shalom that brings alignment. Because that's the revelation. Leave the form of the Holy Spirit, which lead them to righteousness, joy, and peace, right? That's just very small, basic things. And of course, the Father, there's much more. There's, there's so much deep revelation. And of course, much of the revelation the Father has given now comes out of the kingdom of heaven. Comes out with engaging. As a, as a spirit being, you have infused knowledge that comes with the ages that you were walking in before you were sent into your mother's womb. That revelation was lost in the time that you were bound to your soul. Because in the time that you were bound to your soul, your soul had revelation and insight regarding the things that it engaged in at birth and what was taught to it, what, was what it was trained through, the engagement in your friends, your family, your mother, your father, your teachers, the school, television, that shaped you to believe certain things. Now your spirit goes and gets activated and it comes out of the kingdom of heaven and its full capacity of that revelation that it had walked in for centuries. It's an ancient being and it has to re regain everything that is lost. So as you engage in the kingdom of heaven, as you engage with the angels, you engage with the throne, as you engage with the seven spirits, there's an infused knowledge that returns to you that has to get downloaded into your soul and your body. So we're receiving a knowledge that we've always had, but now it's being spoken from uh, uh, Homo sapiens' mouth into the atmosphere and it freaks everybody out. Because it's like, okay, wait, 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 wait. Where's that in the Bible? Where did you get that? What, what scripture is that? I don't get it. I can't believe it. I can't listen to anything that doesn't come out of the Word. You lie, you fry. We listen to all kinds of poop. <laughs> but when someone doesn't preach that, what you'll perceive from the Word, and I, I don't use the Bible all the time when I preach, but everything I preach comes out of the Bible. Now, if you don't know the Bible, that's not my problem. If you don't know the Scripture, that's not my problem. I'm not here to spoon-feed anybody. Right? So it's our responsibility as the Ecclesia to, to study the Word of God and not just the written, but to engage in everything. And we have the availability for that, so because we operate beyond the veil, everything is there for us. The download comes in soaking. That's why soaking is really important. Worshipping, adoring, stepping into the spirit realm. That's why he says, you can only worship me in spirit and truth. Now, of course, you can't go into the spirit without being in the truth. And the truth is the dimension of the word. It's Yeshua, right? How are you guys doing? Okay, last but not least, we engage into the Father. Now, of course, you've got six, six uh, skins, six stones that you've stepped into. And it's dimensional shift, so, as a matter of fact, you're building a wall that the enemy cannot break through. You're stepping into the kingdom of heaven in the realms and dimensions that gives him no authority over you or anything linked to you. So you've got righteousness, joy, and peace. You've got the way, the truth, <clears throat> and the life. Now you want to step into the Father, and the Father out of Psalms 89 is represented by justice, judgment, and mercy. And the scripture says, justice and, uh, justice and um, judgment are the foundations of your throne. Mercy and truth shall go before your faces. So the Father is represented in three skins, justice, judgment, and um, mercy. Now, I love this because I love engaging into the Father. He is a serious dude, but he's a funny guy. Um, I've heard him laugh at me several, several times. And it's because I do stupid things. But I'm, you know, we are kids, and uh, I'm still a child. And I look at Ian and he says, he's been doing this for 38 years. And Justin, between 16 and 17 years. I have a friend, um, uh, uh, Aaron Smith, and he's been engaging in this for a long time. 
You know, they are incredible in the spur. When you see them in the spur, it's like you stop and you, you, you glance at the things that they understand, the revelation they walk in. For me, it's been seven years and I'm just touching base on everything. And of course, you've got such a passion and desire to know all this stuff. You want to engage in everything. Now, what I love about being in the kingdom of heaven is you can multiply your spirit into different places, but you always have to bring it back together again in unity so you can receive the understanding and have that download into your soul. And, but, I, but I love engaging the Father and justice, uh, his dimension of justice is, is that, that he cannot go back on what he's already said. And I love that about him because he said, let us give man dominion over, uh, let's give him dominion over all creation, right? That's the very first thing he said. And we have thought in our theology that he's taken that back. You know, and he hasn't. He's justice. He cannot take back what he said. He's given us authority. He's given us dominion. And dominion represents a space in, in, in sovereignty that we don't always understand. Because God's sovereign. I can't be sovereign. No, he's given you sovereign rights over the earth. Which means he will, he will do everything in his power to get us to understand who we are on the earth, but he's not going to change things for us. Right. He's not going to come in and start doing things. He's going to get us to understand. That's why he tore the veil. That's why I said to Jacob, listen, dude, I've got a ladder. You can go from here up. You know, there is access. It's through intimacy, through relationship. I've done everything. Eventually, with, with, with Yeshua and the blood, when he tore the veil from the top to the bottom, he said, okay, hey, God, you're not listening. Let me show you. And he opened up for us so we can go in. It's through the blood of Yeshua. But his desire for us is to understand that he's given something to us, and he's not going to step back. You know, he's given you destiny purpose. He's given you everything you need to walk in the fullness of what he's created for us and given us to run with. That's his justice side. He's not going to change. Once he's spoken something, that's why, you know, if you look at the whole situation with the ark, it sounds like this is one mean God. It says from the very beginning, if you touch this ark, you will die. So a heathen that didn't know this law, no one told him either, obviously, right? <laughs> so he's carrying this thing, not knowing the, the, the fear that you should have while carrying this. And as it falls, he, what does he do? He wants to stop it. And dies on the spot. You think to yourself, seriously? <laughs> seriously, God? Was that really necessary? But he's a just God, so what he said he has to do. Right. And of course he has purpose and everything. He said he would never just say something because it's a good idea. He said that because it aligns with all that he's already designed for all things to fall into place. But also remind ourselves that because we have sovereignty over the earth, things that, that should happen and could happen might not happen. Not because of the footsteps that God's already ordained for it, but because we're in charge. So when there's storms and floods and uh, wars and rumors of wars and all the things that we see, earthquakes, it's acts of God, it's not acts of God. It's because Satan has in his hand something that we're supposed to control. We, are, we have the weather, we have uh, the tectonic plates, we've got the... the the sun, the moon, we have every planet and every alignment of every galaxy in our hands. It was given to us to govern. We just don't know how to do it. But the Father is teaching His sons because creation is excited because their sons and daughters waking up. Then we begin to understand judgment. And the Father's desire for us is to have revelation of judgment. The, the fact that the church has run away from judgment for about 500 years has to stop. We have to begin to understand as kings... We have to judge. We judge the earth. We judge creation. We judge each other. And it's not judgment to death. We have this thing with judgment. But if I run a race and I win, and I stand on the podium, I'm being judged. That's not a bad judgment. It's a good judgment. But we think that all judgment is bad. And we begin to understand the Father wants to teach us how to judge. Because He's a judge. Because we have to be like him. That's the image that was designed. You know, he said, let us create man in our image. So I'm not in the image of Jesus. I'm not only in the image of Holy Spirit or only in the image of the Father. I'm in the image of Yahweh. That's the Yah, the Hay, the Vafe. That's the lion, ox, eagle, man. That's the mentions of Yahweh that I can step into and live out of. That I am designed to be like him. And one of his major functions is judgment. And the earth is in the mess that it is. Because we have not spoken judgment. And the Father is teaching a generation of people how to judge. That's why when I step into this skin, it begins to open me up. That's why the courts are becoming such a, a fashionable thing to go into and to have understanding of. Because the Father needs us to begin to judge. Now the courts of heaven is different than the court, the mobile court. The mobile court, Yahweh is the judge. Because the accusations 
uh, brought by the enemy. The enemy cannot go into the heavenly courts. We know this, right? He has no access in there. It's a realm that he has been kicked out and he cannot go back in. But the Mo'mal court is here for the accusations made so it can be dealt with. So he makes an accusation on the earth in this atmosphere. The mobile court's brought down with the mobile throne out of Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10. And we begin to understand the Father has opened up that realm where he's the judge. We are the accuser or we are being accused by the, the accusations made against us. And the protocol that needs to be followed. We've got the seven spirits, we've got the angels, we've got Yeshua, the advocate, we've got all the cloud of witnesses that's there to cheer us on. But in the courts of heaven is a whole different place. That's where legislation takes place. That's where we begin to understand that we need to bring judgment to what's taking place in the, in the earth. So we take a situation, we take an issue, a problem, we bring it into one of the courts according to what the issue is. Whether it's the um, court of war, court of angels, court of scribes, court of fathers, court of kings, court of the Lord, whatever you need to bring into understanding or in full fruition it's taken to this court according to what the seven spirits have taught you, according to what you know, according to what access you have, because some of the courts you don't have access into until you do certain things. But it's really the Father's desire for us to begin to understand that I, He has created us and designed for us to begin to be chancellors in the courts. Because a chancellor is oh, one who overshadows the court and releases legislation and aligns things into place. That's why we will go into the court as a, as a son and we will have the ability to to legislate certain things, to talk about certain things, to bring the um, right judicial uh, law into place according to what's supposed to happen, according to what's written, and the uh, chancellor will give the um, okay, the yay or the nay, if that makes any sense. Now, I don't always understand exactly how the courts work. I've been touching base on a lot of it, more than what I have in the last two years. Um, I'm still getting to understand. Uh, the Father has given me 24 states over the last couple of months, and in understanding who I am in the spirit, I have to engage in the courts regarding these states to legislate certain things into place. So there's a lot of more, a lot more work taking place in the courts for me as what there's ever been before. So I'm slowly but surely beginning to understand a little bit more of it, but not enough to really just speak a revelation into it and for everybody to understand what I'm saying. Because sometimes I still have to speak and still think, what did I just say? But it's a process. But it's understanding the Father wants us to begin to judge. And of course, we begin to understand as a oracle, your, what you speak is judgment. Same as prophecy. When I prophesy over you, I'm judging you. you know, discernment uh, as one of the gifts. It's, pro it's, it's judgment. You know, because I'm discerning. I'm judging what I see. And of course, we discern the judge by the fruits that we, we have in our lives. But we, we also we have to judge out of the heart of God. That's why if you walk with the seven spirits, you read it out of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 11, you'll begin to understand it says, and he will not judge for the sight of his eyes. Because we have been judging with the sight of our eyes, and nor with the hearing of his ears. So we don't judge by what we heard. We don't judge with what we see. We judge according to the Spirit. And according to the Spirit, when judgment comes to a son or daughter of the Most High, it's to life. Okay, but judgment to a demonic or power of principality is to death nullification. Okay, but those spirits get judged out of the, court, uh, the mobile court. Because that's how we want to eliminate them. Exciting, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then, of course, we have mercy. And we begin to understand, when, when the father begins to experience a son or daughter in the kingdom of heaven, there's great joy that comes in the kingdom of heaven. And as for me, it's been seven years, which is not that much, but I remember one of the first times I got, went into the heaven, the first time I went in, it was according to my protocol. And I was all freaked out. I was taught that you have to die to go to heaven, so just being there was a freaky experience. I was taught that if you see God, you will die, so I thought to myself, okay, this is it, I'm going to die because I'm seeing God. Um, I saw him afar on the throne because I had to step onto the throne room and it was burning with a flame, a blue flame. <coughs> my natural understanding is I can't step on the fire, I'll burn. And I was there with my natural perception regarding what it should be like. So I already had a predestined revelation regarding what I believe it should be or according to what they had taught me. And I, got, I went through the whole process. Eventually I did step on the floor. My whole body started burning with an orange yellow red flame which was non-consuming but it felt to me that for the first time I can actually breathe. So as I walked to the throne it was more like a glide, more like a, like a, um, thought, a travel being, being moved by thought speed because I wanted to be there and before I knew it I was there but it was like a glide to there. It was just weird. And I remember standing in front of the father looking at him and he stood up, did what he was going to do according to what he wanted to do, you know, an engagement, a prayer that I prayed. I wanted him to anoint me and so that's exactly what he did. And afterwards, when he hugged me, it was just, it was just that, that dimensional shift in him, that understanding 
everything's changing right now. So I couldn't wait to come back. I, I remember waking up and there was a guy standing in front of me. I was on the preacher call <laughs> at the gym, my, training my arm, my biceps. And he looked at me and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know, dude. Just hang out. <laughs> but I remember going back the very next day and it was completely different. When I put my foot on that floor, Yahweh jumped off the throne, ran to me, picked me up, threw me in the air, hugged me, helped me. The protocol changed because my perception changed. He was excited. As a matter of fact, from that day on for maybe a year in engagement, every time I stepped in to the kingdom of heaven, it was like heaven would stop. And everybody that was there would just get all excited because another son entered in. And at this point, there wasn't all that many people really engaging into the kingdom of heaven. It was probably more than what I could see because my sight was not as developed as what it is now. And my engagement wasn't as intense as what it is now because eventually the father did call me into another kingdom and said, my son, we need to begin to change the way you do things because this is what we call scaffolding. It's a word that I invented. I'm very proud of that word, to be honest. But um, he basically told me that something needs to change because there's too much. I, I, there's too much that I need to do for you to continue to play a game that you're playing. You know? But it was just fun being in the kingdom of heaven, never been there before, writing all kinds of stuff, doing all kinds of stuff, fun stuff. You know? But it changed. It had to change because the Father wanted me to get serious because there's so much to do. I'm still having fun, still doing a lot of things in the kingdom of heaven, but there's so much. Because the more revelation you get out of the kingdom of heaven, the more things open up because I can have fun with my spirit divided into a specific area in the kingdom of heaven where the other dimensions of my spirit doing other things. And then it all comes together as I download it and soak it. But it began to teach me about His mercy. But it began to show me that although I'm going against protocol, I'm not doing things the way it's supposed to. In the courts, I'm operating like a baby. I have no idea what I'm doing. But it's mercy because he's my child, because I'm his child and he's my daddy. He would say, no, it's okay, come in. Sit down, behave yourself, and let me show you what we're doing. And then eventually we'll come in and say, well, you see, the last time you came in, you did that, and it was okay. But I showed you the protocol. You are not doing it. You need to follow the protocol that I've given you. So it's, it just changes, and he just shifts. But his mercy and his grace, like the excitement that he has for the ecclesia is what just holds everything together. Because we are beginning to understand, we're beginning to change, we're beginning to grow and mature, and we're beginning to become what is destined for us to be. It's incredible and it's exciting. So the idea of these nine skins is I'm stepping into the, the, the righteousness, the joy, and the peace. I'm stepping into the way, the truth, and the life. I step into judges, justice, judgment, and mercy. That's nine skins plus my three, body, soul, spirit, that literally represents the, the 12 the stones on the breastplate, uh, which makes a dimensional shift where I go into who I am as the high priest. Um, we have been taught that you can't be the high priest because Yeshua is the high priest, but Yeshua is my example of what I need to be. See, as a legislator, as one, as a son, a daughter, that operates from out of the kingdom of heaven, beyond the veil, I have to become the high priest because if I pray for my city and judgment comes upon my city, that judgment has to come through me first. That judgment cannot just directly go through the city because there's people in the city that's not born again. So I stand in the gap for the city, and judgment comes through me as the high priest, the one that is in the fullness of righteousness, um, peace, and joy, the one who stands in the way, the truth, and the life, the one who represents the fullness of justice, judgment, and the mercy of Yahweh. He judges through me. My spirit has gone through a process of uh, re-engage, reactivation. My, my soul is going through the process of change, and my body is going through the process of becoming glorified. So I am standing in the kingdom of heaven, beyond this side of the veil, in the kingdom of heaven, and the Father is echoing through me what He wants to do into the nations. Um, so that kind of brings us to that place when we realize it's more than just going to church on a Sunday, putting our hands together, uh, praying, clapping, singing a song, doing it again next week, and uh, doing it again maybe on a Wednesday, and uh, beginning to understand that it's, it's more than that. We need to begin to operate out of the kingdom of heaven, a full revelation of who we are as sons and daughters, and these skins begins to show us the protection, the covering that Yahweh is to us. That's a dimension of covering that we can't even understand. Satan cannot get to you if you're in. And inside of those nine skins is where I move and live and have my being. It's in him that I go and travel into the nations. It's in that, those nine skins that I do all the things in the kingdom of heaven. It's in that that everything I operate in today takes place out of. That's why I can operate out of the four faces. That's why I can operate out of the yard, the hate, the love, that because it's all in all of who he is. And of course, this is probably just the milk of who he is. It's not even less, the powder milk. 
<laughs> because he's an infinite God and we can't even begin to understand. But he's made all this stuff available to us and we just need our fools engage into it as much as we can, as hard as we can. And of course, because of a lack of focus, and I know it's not just me, we need to go back in as often as possible. And that's why I, I over the last couple of years, have made every engagement, everything I do, um, to bring focus to the kingdom of heaven, what the engagement was. If I get into my car, if I get into the shower, if I put on my shirt, if I put on my pants, if I climb into my shoes, if I walk out of the door, I walk in the door, if I open up the curtains, whatever I'm busy doing in my house, whatever I'm doing at any time during my day, I'm engaging. God, I need a trigger to, to be pulled all the time for me to step in. Um, the idea is, of course, to be in there all the time, but we can't be in there all the time. And because we're operating out of, si out of time and space when we're there, it doesn't matter how long we're in there. The idea is just to go in there. And when you're in there, you're going to experience things. And of course, we have to make time for soaking, um, not with a soul, but engaging and having your soul and your spirit aligned with what your, with your, having your soul and your body aligned with what your spirit man is really doing to bring the full fruition of the revelation the Father wants to bring into us as, as the sons and Lord of the Most High. Exciting, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's stand up. <coughs> Father, we just want to thank you and praise you and just glorify and magnify your majestic, beautiful name. There's so much that you're bringing to us, Father. There's so much insight and revelation that's being released into the atmosphere, even in the city, Father God, even the revelation that comes out of these small meetings, Father God, we have spoken into the atmosphere as big as an oracle, not just as a mere man. I thank you, Father, for the enhancement of the spirit being, that we are beginning to understand that we are more than just what we were born into. We are what you created and designed for us to be. Spirit beings full of your glory, full of revelation, knowledge, insight, walking in your living and moving into the nine skins, operating from out of your faces, beginning to understand the gates that we live from, that we are gates, we are doors, and when we align with righteousness, those doors open, those gates begin to open because we are the key and all of Yahweh gets to be poured into the nations, which brings alignment to things that sons and daughters begin to walk in the earth full of your glory and your fire. I ask for revelation for everyone in this room. I pray, Father, we will engage in the deeper levels, deeper levels, and we will go into the kingdom of heaven, get to eat of the fruit in Eden, get to spend intense, intimate time with you, getting to know you and love you at levels that we never thought possible. Begin to understand what it means to be one with you, where we are the body and you are the head, Father, and how that function works into the earth, that legislation from that place of intimacy, that place of oneness, and how that is brought into the earth, Father. Where we shifted from being the bride, and we're entering into that place where we are the body, and you are the head, and it changes all that we understand, all that we have known, because now we think with your brain, we see with your eyes, we hear with your, eyes, with your ears, and we begin to speak with your mouth. Everything changes. I just want to thank you and praise you that we can be part of all of that right now. And as the saints of old is trying, to, not trying, but is, is sowing into us in this time, Father, let's be open for it. Let's understand that you're the God of the living, not the dead. That even those who have passed on are in the kingdom of heaven and they want to be part of this day by giving us mantles, giving us batons, trading into our time right now. And Father, we want to be open for all of that. So I ask you to give us revelation and insight. Let's operate in the fullness of what you've made available and run with all of it. We love you, we praise you. In the name of Yeshua. Amen.